Can you all hear me well? I think so, yeah. So, um, yeah, great uh, to be back here. So, YAML camp, huh, I guess, is, is how it's called now. So, last time, uh, or recently, I gave a talk uh, about uh, the future of YAML in, in uh, configuration and infrastructure. So, uh, so it's a good uh, talk to continue that here, hence the future in the title, I guess. Um, it's, um, yeah, so James has been uh, pointing out to me, he's sitting here somewhere in the audience, I don't see him now. Ah, ah there, yeah, I don't have my good glasses on for uh, far seeing. Um, and he said, like, yeah, you really should focus more on the, on the management part, or your talks are always more about configuration, and, and you know, like, you've you got to uh, also dive more into the management. So, that, you know, that's absolutely true that I, that I do that, so to be very clear. Um, so Q, the system that I've been working on, is quite agnostic about the management part. You can retrofit it on the management part and, uh, you know, so I'm focused on what I'm good at here. So, so just to, to set the scope here for these, for these things, and I should work together with James Moore to, to sort of unite that stuff, but, uh, you know. Um, so YAML, so uh, my journey in 4Q started about, uh, about the same year that YAML uh, got invented, which is 2001 which was a very exciting year in total. Uh, you know, Mac OS X uh, came out as well, like this a cool smartphone looked like that back then. Uh, who would have known, right? Like, um, so it was also during the dot-com crisis. So I started working for this startup in natural language processing. Um, like really cool technology, it doesn't really uh, exist anymore. Everything is deep learning nowadays. Um, and that startup also failed uh, very quickly, right? Because of the dot-com uh, crash, but um, what was very nice is that this, um, this technology I worked on, right, and everybody that worked on it got very excited about it. So what I didn't realize back then, took me about uh, 10, 15 years to really realize this, is that uh, the grammars that we were creating uh, there, or like mostly not me, but linguists and stuff like that, um, so the properties they have uh, was basically very, very similar to very large-scale cloud configurations, right? It's uh, basically lots of regularity and lots of, lots of irregular exceptions uh, within these uh, regularities, right? Um, and, and this is very, very hard to manage, right? And um, within this field, they really spend decades trying to find out a good representation that could uh, be understood by both engineers and non-engineers, right? But it took me a while to realize that. But um, then when I lost my job, I ended up working at Google, right? And there, um, the, my first uh, project was, okay, let's take this uh, MLP stuff that you know so much about and let's put it in a search engine, not with the aim to, you know, do anything with, this, in it, with the search engine, but more to get familiar with the search engine. I was working on the search engine. And um, so MLP back then was quite expensive, so all the test setups that they had didn't really work for me. Um, so I thought, like, okay, uh, all the servers they had were very optimized, was, was, was a very heterogeneous machine pool. And basically, um, if I wanted to have servers to do more testing, I had to weigh them because I had to configure them and basically build all these machines. Uh, on the other hand, MapReduce wasn't invented yet, so there was this cluster for batch processing sitting there with a thousand machines that nobody knew how to use, a uh, homogeneous pool. And it's like, huh, so maybe if I run these tests there, Right, then I have my machines right away. I just have to rewrite, uh, you know, like restructure all the search engine services, uh, servers so that they uh, can run on hom a homogeneous pool of machines. Um, but let's do that, right? And also the configuration was a big problem there because um, uh, I had to redo everything and I want to be able to, you know, do it incrementally. So I thought, okay, I need to really have this flexible configuration. Let's use what I did in NLP, right? Because that seems awesome. So this was sort of the first, um, you could say, Kubernetes-like system um, um, so that it was made, but it was really made for testing and making testing uh, quick and, you know, look, doing speedy development. So this system got on within Google very quickly, and before I knew it, people were actually launching uh, beta stuff, but, you know, sort of in test production, but still in production, public stuff is like, oh, no, 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 right, do not do that. This is not a production system at all. And um, even Sergey came to me and was like, okay, well, what's the worst thing that go, can go wrong? It's like, well, you might go down for a week. It's like, is that all? It's like, I guess if that's all, yeah, it's a beta, right? But anyway, so we realized, okay, we need to build something like this um, for uh, production. It's actually production ready. Uh, also, the infrastructure was moving to servers that could deal with homogeneous machines, so hence Borg, right? So I started on the Borg team. Um, and focus on the tooling and, and the configuration um, of it all and stuff like that. Um, 
And I wanted to do that same thing we did with NLP, right? It's like, yeah, it's a little bit weird, right? Like it's all like logic programming and nobody understands that. So let's do more overrides and inheritance. That's what people know, right? So that's what we did. And that turned out to be this, this very big mistake, right? Because all the complexity essentially comes from that. But, you know, um, Google engineers, uh, they, they, they don't mind the complexity, generally speaking, right? And, and it sort of worked, right? Like it, it, it worked for, for um, to some extent, but it's uh, it's a bit messy. Uh, but at then uh, at that time, I moved to Switzerland. I forgot about it a little bit. Started working on the Go team. But at some point, I started seeing, okay, uh, all these problems, right, with uh, with this configuration system. It's like, okay, what if I had done um, um, the you know my original idea? Um, and basically, I thought like, yeah, we could have prevented all these problems, right? Like the configurations were at that time in the same order of magnitude as the, as the grammars from, from 20 years ago, right? So, so that seemed, you know, like the, the very similar properties, right? So that seemed like a good approach. Anyway, that's where I got, um, um, you know, a little bit of background to understand where Q is coming from and, and, and what it does. So also this gave me a lot of insights, right? Like on, on what actually is configuration, how should you think about configuration? And so at the last part of my, my tenure at Google before I started working on Q full time, was just like, okay, like now you have all these ideas about configuration that are kind of you know, weird and alien. So can you use that to analyze our postmortems and see if you can see a pattern there? Like, is there something we can learn from, about, um, uh, from configuration? And uh, so I did that. And um, so you can see this in public, like a lot of people have done research in this and generally speaking as a, as a guideline you see that about 50% of the especially bigger outages uh, tend to be configuration related. Um, and this was also my experience that this is the case. And um, yeah, you know, this, these are very costly outages, right? Like the, you lo the companies lose a lot of money. Uh, like people cannot use uh, use you know critical services sometimes, so you you really want to to avoid this. Uh, people lose trust in the company. Um, so on the left you see one quote. So this is a, a, a published post mortem. It's public. Uh, Google published it. Like what caused this outage? And it was basically related to a quota management uh, system. So this is one of the largest outages they had. Uh, it's very widespread. And um, so so you know. It doesn't really feel like configuration, but, uh, but it is, right? But, but not the typical configuration failures that people think of, right? A lot of people think like, okay, you specify a Boolean where you should specify a string, or you have like a number that's outside of a certain range. Like these problems don't really occur anymore, right? Like, uh, like uh, it happened earlier on, right? But that's the, all these problems have sort of been ironed out. But the funny thing is that over time, the percentage of outages related to configuration sort of stays the same. Right? So it's just that over time, as, as the company grew more complex, as the configurations grow more complex, also the bugs get more and more complex. Right? And um, I'll get back to what it is, you know, what, what exactly is configuration, but in a nutshell, um, you know, it, it, it most, mostly boils down to being able actually statically to know that something will, will fail, but then uh, you don't have this information available or you don't use the information before a launch, right? So you, you could have prevented it, but, but then you don't. So this is this whole you know, shift left um, thing. So don't just take my word for it. So these are some observations of former colleagues. Um, and you know, basically, just standard stuff. I don't like bullet points, but you know, just to throw some things out here. So you know, validating, testing, typing. I put this on one line because in Q, this is all the same thing basically. Uh, you want to do policy enforcement is also in, uh, configuration. You want to shift <coughs> left also, um, and you want to go to a single source of truth, whatever that might mean, right? So uh, I'll, I'll get back to that. So really the question now here is, uh, and this came back in the research also, like, well, what actually is configuration, right? Like if you see an outage, is this a configuration related outage, is it not, right? Um, so this was a, actually a remarkably hard question to answer. Um, and I'll get back to that. Uh, but as I said, right, like the understanding of what this configuration came very much from the sort of the insights we got from Pew. So in order to, to um, um, you know, explain it, I'll give a little crash course on Q first. Um, so this is focusing on Q, the language. So Q is really like a logic engine. 
Uh, it has uh, tooling, you know, CLIs, APIs. You can you can um, get to a lot of this functionality programmatically, where right? you don't have to use the language per se. Um, but it's the you know the easiest to visualize and to to reason about. So um, at its from the start, at least, uh, Q is basically a superset of JSON. Um, it's, uh, so here you see on the left hand some JSON, on the right hand some Q. Um, so it's really then, you know, boils down if you just want to represent data in, in, in Q, it's, it's just syntactic sugar, right? So you can drop the quotes, you can drop the commas. That's actually quite tricky to do that in a, in a language. You got that trick from Go. Um, you have some, you know, you can use SI suffixes to make a number shorter. Um, and um, you know that that pretty much sums it up for the for the simple representation of data, but you can also represent types. So on the left you see Go, on the right you see Q, um, and you see that's almost the same, right? Except that you still have the colons uh, after the fields uh, in Q, and and like lists are represented slightly differently, but it looks very similar. Um, then you can also do uh, validation or putting constraints on, or you know, like a schema, however you want to call it, uh, APIs. So on the left hand you see some JSON schema. I'll zoom in in a moment. On the right hand you see the queue. So here we have, um, you know, something that's a little bit more specific than than, an, um, uh, than a struct. So maybe describing a specific machine type. Um, so for example, if you want to say that a field is of type string in JSON schema, you would do this like this. And in Q, you do it like you see on the right-hand side. Um, same thing if a value is an, uh, is an enumeration. Um, Left-hand side JSON schema, right-hand side Q. It's just a or symbol, right? Like you can write multiple values. Um, same thing for uh, relations or constraints. Like if you want to limit a, val a number range, right? Like you can do that like this in, in Q. Um, and you can also do that with... Um, with um, I missed a slide here, I think. But you can do that with, uh, with arrays as well. So now, um, Q can also do templating. You won't see much difference, because in Q, templating and validation is really the same thing. Um, but just, just for good measure, I'll show you some HCL as well. So Q also has expression. So this, this expression you see here in HCL, you could do exactly the same thing in Q, but typically you would write it like this. Um, so Q doesn't assign, it's, it's, as I said, it's management layer agnostic, so it doesn't assign any special value to any field, right? So there is no variable section like an HCL. Um, um, but you can, you know, you can interpret any variable, uh, anything, however you want. Uh, but uh, the mechanism that Q has in this case then is that you can tag it. So there's this tag attribute. Uh, you have attributes uh, are used for many different things, and th uh, but with the tag attribute you can say, okay, I have these uh, you know names that I'm using as variables in which I can uh, you know inject things on the command line, for example, or programmatically. Um, um, so so Q is very much focused on being hermetic, right? Like all the good uh, properties you want to have for a configuration language. So just like HCL, you can also reference then these variables, right? So so same same thing. So validation, um, so as I said, Q doesn't have any specific you know, inter interpreted section, so there's no validation section, but you can write validation directly in Q, so that's how that would translate. And then one thing you haven't seen yet, uh, Q has something like defaults. So I said um, uh, before maybe like uh, that Q doesn't have overrides or that overrides and inheritance is a very bad thing to do. I lied, uh, so default values are actually inheritance. Um, so, but in practice, when I say you shouldn't do inheritance, if you do one layer of inheritance, it's generally fine. The problem is that's very limited. Actually, that's how GCL started out. It was one of the requirements. Uh, if you do it at the structure level, that doesn't really work. It's too limiting. But we found that if you just have defaults, um, you cover 90% uh, plus of what you want to do with inheritance, and you don't have uh, all the complexity you get from it right later. But, you know, different story. Not really uh, important to understand for this talk. Um, so comments are first-class citizens in Q. Uh, you can access it from the API quite easily and all that stuff. So this is uh, how you would typically do a description. Um, so one thing to note, if you look at all of these, is that no matter whether you have validation, templating, um, uh, schema, data, it's all the same structure, right? Like the, so, so for Q, the structure remains the same for all of these. And you can also mix and match that, right? So you can have a, um, uh, like a structural object, however you want to call it, that is partly data, 
and partly validation, partly schema, um, and partly templating. And um, this is a very important property of Q, um, and I'll explain later why this is so important. So, another, uh, another um, um, way to view Q is that really um, it's, um, it's, it's like a spreadsheet, like a type spreadsheet for JSON. Um, so really what we are thinking is like, Q should be very, very simple. Right? And you should have only simple expressions at wherever, wherever you have expressions, right? like wherever it's not data. Um, and uh, if you want to do any kind of complex computation, it's much better to use a programming language. Right? Um, so right now we have a, a lot of built-ins uh, in Q that you can use for all kinds of stuff. Some of them are, are quite uh, generic, so you can do a lot of computation outside. But we're also working on like a WASM integration so that you can really hook in uh, any, any language. But we, we think that configuration should, uh, in essence, be simple. Um, so why is that? And this is also one of the, the things where, where I also in the past have gone wrong. So if you think about scripting and, and uh, programming languages, right? So a scripting language, the goal is you want to get something out quickly. Uh, you want to experiment, right? You want something to be very expressive, right? So, um, but this expresses, expressiveness goes at the expense of readability. Um, which if you're working in a team, that's not great, right? In a team, if you write something, you want your other teammates to be able to read it quite easily. Um, and, um, you know, other people could also be you in a, a week later, because very often if I write something down and, and I do it quick and I read it, you know, a week or a month later, I might not even know myself what I've written, right? So readability is key in programming languages. So, and it depends a bit how you're using configuration and what setting you use it, but in a large company, it's, it's very often that the team that has to read configuration, very often in an emergency setting also, is not the team that actually wrote um, the configuration, right? So if one team says, I want to write in Go, or the other says, I want to write in Scala, you cannot assume that the people looking at the configuration actually know these languages, right? So you want something that is much more um, um, straightforward, right? Like something like JSON, uh, as close as possible, that people can actually understand what you're doing. Um, so inheritance flies in the face on that, in, of that, right? It makes things way more complex. It's incredibly hard to track where values are coming from once you start doing that. And so, so Q has been designed with, with that in mind also. So can you now finally tell me what you have learned about configuration, right? Because I've had all these uh, detours. So let's look at a very simple um, setup. Um, so here we have a Pong server, so a user can send a ping request, um, and all the server does is reply with Pong. Um, you know, we, have, we make it a little bit more complicated, so we're using Terraform to set up a com Google Compute instance. Uh, we're setting up a database uh, in which uh, audit logs are stored. Um, maybe a bit excessive to use a database for that, but why not? It's a, an example. And then we have also an open policy agent that um, does some checks on the incoming messages. So where is the configuration here? Well, uh, one very obvious one is, of course, the Terraform configuration, right? Like that shouldn't surprise anybody. I'm not going into details there, not very interesting. So another one is, for example, the server itself could have a configuration file, could be a JSON thing, uh, but also command line arguments are configuration, environment variables are configuration, uh, feature flags are configuration, although that's more part of the code, but... Um, so this is all configuration, but again, nothing surprising here, uh, probably. Um, now it gets a little bit more interesting. What about the database, right? Is, is, is that configuration? Is, uh, well, arguably the data could be configuration. In this case, I would argue it's not. Um, but what about the schema, right? Well, um, so, so let's hold that thought for now. Is this configuration or not? Um, but on the right-hand side, you see how would I represent this uh, SQL, Google SQL uh, schema in uh, Q on the right-hand side, right? So you see, again, it looks very much like a, like a struct, a schema, but it has some limitations on string lengths. Uh, and at the bottom of the SQL, you see that the, the, the method right, for the incoming message uh, has to be either get or post. Um, so we represent it in Q as well, right? So this is basically a Q representation of that schema. So at least you can represent it in Q, which is um, uh, generally, um, you know, sort of starts hinting at maybe maybe it is configuration. Um, but why would be, that be relevant, right? Now let's look at the server. So if you're looking at the server, you'll find some uh, feature flags potentially. 
and things. But uh, one thing we see there is that we have this ghost struct uh, that the server uses to, to stage uh, an audit log that it can then write to the database, right? But this maps one and one to, to uh, the database schema. So now you're already seeing one problem here, right? So the ghost struct uh, in idiomatic Go, I mean, I guess you could uh, uh, do something, but typically in idiomatic Go, you would write string. You're not creating an array of 100 to, to, to limit the strings that you could uh, put in there. But you're already seeing here that you have a discrepancy between what the database table says and what, um, what Go says, right? So you can actually create an audit struct that once you write it to the database, uh, you get a runtime failure, right? So um, whereas clearly all the information is available statically to determine uh, that this could be a problem, right? Um, so where else is configuration? So let's look at the uh, open policy agent, right? So is policy configuration or not? So this is again, it's a very simple rule. It only says that uh, the input method in this case should be get. So even though the server supports post and get, uh, we're saying no, we're only gonna allow get, right? For incoming messages as a matter of policy. So Rego does something simplicity. So there is an uh, implicit input field which has the incoming message. Um, and then basically you have to drill down in it the way Rego works. It's also logic programming, but you retrieve, um, you retrieve the information and then you compare it against the value. You could do that in Q, not very idiomatic the way uh, you do it in Q. It's more you, you push the constraints into the structure, which is uh, in this case it makes it longer, but generally you would see that, that a typical Q would be a half to a quarter of a typical Rego application in size. Uh, but this is a way to do it. Um, now, if we continue, so um, if, if the Pong server, you know, is set up nicely, it would also advertise what is my API, right? And you can do that with OpenAPI, for example. So on the left-hand side, again, you see some OpenAPI. On the right-hand side, you see a possible representation in Q. And um, one thing to note here also is that, um, so in this API definition, you only have get also, right? So this sort of uh, implies that post is not allowed. But here also you see you have multiple sources of truth, right? You have your policy engine that say you can only have get, but also the API that you're publishing is saying the same thing, right? Um, so I guess you could argue, well, uh, post could be defined here somewhere else, but then in Q you could say, well, you know, like no, um, so the square bracket things is like a pattern matching thing in Q. So here you can say, if you see any path uh, where, where it's not get within, within the, the ping server or the ping request, then it is an error. Um, so this would be an alternative way potentially of, of representing that constraint uh, you saw earlier. So in general, you can see now that um, so this is a very simple service, but even here you have uh, not a single truth for a lot of things that we would consider uh, configuration, right? So whether it's policy, schema, uh, constraints on schema, validation, right? Like in this very simple service, it's all over the place. I, I can go on, you can find other things. Um, but all over the place you have these things where there's no single source of truth where you can see there is a potential for, for a failure that in many cases you could determine statically, but you don't, right? So how do we envision now that, that you could deal with this, right? So, um, so one way to do is to determine what is the, the overall contracts or what are the contracts that are in play in the system here, right? So you can imagine it's like, okay, in some cases we extract some of this information from code or we extract it from various places. Uh, we put it into a, uh, we write it, conver uh, convert it to Q, right? In other cases, it could be that you write it in Q and you convert it to, um, to uh, some other representation. So for example, Istio is a project that uses uh, Q from converting protocol buffers to open API generation. So it's not using it for configuration checking, but pure for morphing between these different representations. Um, and the whole point there is to fail early, right? To, to get as much information as possible um, left. So now, um, the picture I've represented a little bit here is that Q basically um, uh, treats all uh, configuration at all these different levels, right? So you have types, you have API, policy, validation, templates. Um, so these are all different levels of abstractions, if you will. Um, the reality isn't quite that simple. 
So in the reality, there's actually a lot of overlap between these. We've seen this a little bit already, where like with the database schema, you have validation bleeding into schema, and you know, um, in practice, you see this quite a lot, right? And um, if you have things like uh, like templates, as we can see later, templates are often also validation. Depends on how you use it. Um, so the way we see it, it's, uh, so Q, it's very convenient that you can do all these different representations in a single language, uh, and it has the same structure. You don't have to learn uh, all these different things. Uh, but it's not just a nice to have. It's actually a necessity that you can represent this all in, the, in a single uh, framework. So if you don't have that, there's no way to cross-validate this stuff. Um, so this is actually a quote from the uh, uh, cloud.google.com. Uh, so um, what they observed there is that if you have infrastructure as code, um, so if you're representing your configuration as code, you, you actually, what you're giving off is on explicit contracts, right? So another thing that's really important in Q is that you're very explicit about your contracts, that you know exactly what are the interfaces between systems, uh, how is your data represented, uh, right, and, and, and if, you, if you do not do declarative uh, configuration, you're, you're, you're basically at a loss quite quickly, right. Um, this is a quote from Kelsey, tweet from Kelsey, um, basically is, uh, saying the same thing. Um, so how do we reconcile all these different parts in Q? So one other uh, very important aspect of Q that I haven't mentioned yet is that um, um, it, so if you, if you start using inheritance and, and overrides, so one of the problems of that is that it makes things uh, much more complex and hard to understand. Um, another problem with that is that now, once you, once you have these overrides, um, the order in which you apply these overrides matter, right? Like whatever you apply last wins. Um, but that means that you have to um, uh, assign a certain order uh, to, to how you're applying these things. And this kind of works in software engineering, right, which is a little bit more like regular engineering where you take these components and you start layering them and there's always sort of a, an obvious last, not always, right, like if you, if you, you know, did your study in, in, in OO and this is one of the reasons uh, that Go went to polymorphism and not subtype um, uh, inheritance, right. But, uh, but generally speaking, there's more natural uh, uh, order to things. Whereas with uh, configuration, usually things come in, we saw this in the, this little example service, things are coming in from all these different sides, right? Like what uh, inherits from what? Does, uh, is the Rego more important than the, than the open API or not? Like, like, I don't know, right? It just comes in from all these different angles. So if you're now gonna be forced to apply an order to this, like it, it makes things incredibly complex, right? Like you have this large string potentially of things um, um, you know, creating this combinatorial explosion. So what Q does, it represents everything in a way um, that the order in which you combine things doesn't matter. So you don't have to think about these things at all. Um, but more importantly, it, it allows you to combine things in a, in a very simple way of uh, thinking about it, uh, once you get it. Um, so here we see, uh, so the basic concept is that you put all your configuration aspects, no matter whether it's schema or data or policy, you all put it into a single namespace. And one way I like to think about it is like a RESTful path, right? So you have a RESTful path, um, and if you have like data configuration, right, it basically means it's one concrete path all the way um, to the end, for example. Um, but let's consider this tree. So this is, uh, so we have some Kubernetes deployments and services. We have two environments, production and development. Um, and, and let's see what this means for Q in this, in this case, right? So. So if we have a deployment Pong service that we want to put somewhere in this tree, it's quite simple. Um, it's a production service, it's a deployment, it's called Pong. So we, uh, we put that at this place in the tree, right? And this, is, uh, this top line is how you would roughly write that in Q. And the, the, you know, the uh, curly braces dot 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 is just the JSON configuration of that uh, Pong service. But um, so we also have a Pong service in development, and a lot of these, um, these um, you know, fields would be the same, right, for, for, um, for both Pong services. So what if we want to specify something that's common to both? Well, in, in Q, you can, uh, you can basically put a, a wildcard uh, in a path, and it's the square brackets, uh, because you can really do any kind of pattern matching to select, uh, you know, like, like which... Uh, which subtree you want to apply it to, but in this case, let's, let's just do a star equivalent, right? So we're saying, okay, we're matching in any environment, production or development, 
we want to set these fields for the Pong service, right? So this could be anything that's in common. Um, but it could also be validation, right? Like any validation that we want to have in common. At this level, you, you start thinking validation uh, often. Um, but then we can also say like, well, wait a minute, we also have uh, fields that are common to all deployments in any kind of uh, environment. And then we just introduce another wildcard and it looks like this and you, you push uh, all this information to all these uh, services. Um, so one thing that's, that you start thinking here is like if you have a deployment schema, so the generic uh, schema for deployments, this is where you would uh, jam that in basically. So let's make that a little bit more concrete. Um, so if, um, um, so in Q you have this directory structure where basically at the top level, this is an option where at the top level you, you, you can have a queue that applies to all the subdirectories, so that's the setup we have here. So anything that's specific to production or development, we put into the, um, into the queue files in this uh, directory, and anything that applies to all of it, we put in the parent directory. Um, so there's also a QMod directory, which is sort of like a .git directory that marks sort of the boundary of your whole hermetic uh, um, system. So if we then want to set, um, you know, like anything specific to the deployment Pong service, so let's say we want to set replicas to, uh, to six, so this is actually the only thing we, we vary in this case, um, we can, you know, to specify the path for that and set spec replicas, which is a Kubernetes things to six. Um, we could have put in this all in one line, right? So as I said, Q has no uh, awareness of any kind of meaning of any fields. It's just data. There's no special interpretation anywhere. Uh, so this could have been on one field, but sort of idiomatically, it's nice to split the path from the, from the data, I find. Um, so now we can also say, okay, let's put, put uh, all the fields that are common to, to the Pong service in production or dev. We can write it like this. Uh, we can also use the wildcard, as we said before. Um, now, one thing that you note, um, because we don't typically use inheritance, so replicas does not have a number, it just says it's an integer, uh, and that basically signals, okay, in any of the you know, production and, de and development, you have to set this integer to a certain value. So generally speaking, this is, the, this is a better approach. It's, it's, uh, having default values is, is not that great. Uh, in many cases, sometimes it is, but in many cases it's not. In this case, I would argue it's also not a good idea to do. But if you really wanted to, you could do it like this, right? You can say, okay, by default I have one, uh, but it could also be really any integer. Um, so you can write it like this if you had to, not recommend it. Um, so now let's say we want to uh, mix on some, some requirements or constraints or some enforcements, right? So um, because Q, because you have this, uh, this order independence, I can just put it in a different file, right? So let's say I'm, in, I'm putting anything monitoring related in monitoring.q. Gets automatically mixed in in these same, same paths, right? So what I'm basically saying here is we want to have for any Pong service, we want to um, set Prometheus scrape, uh, scraping to true, always. Right? And, uh, well, somebody else might say, well, that's a great idea. We really want to enforce this as a matter of policy throughout uh, the entire, uh, for all deployments. So you can just uh, change that into a wildcard if you have to. Um, so in this case, um, it's a validation rule, if you will. Um, but it can also be templating, right? Uh, this, this same rule both verifies that if somebody specifies it, it's there, but on the other hand, it's also mixed in. So it's also templating at the same time, right? However you want to interpret it. You could also say, well, we recommend you do it, so we make it a default, right? So, so here you see a rule that's both um, uh, convenience templating as well as validation, right? It it's, uh, enforces that you don't use a Boolean, but rather use the string true, which is a requirement in this case. Um, um, you know, so, so you could do that, and then you can even say, well, okay, we recommend it for any service, but at least in production you have to turn it on, right? So here you can see that even in multiple places, you, you can have different departments, have different policies or whatever, that all gets mixed in, um, and you could have, uh, not conflicting, but basically the same paths, and basically what it does, it takes the um, you know, the, the lowest common denominator, if you will, the, or the greatest lower bound, however you want to uh, view this. But in this case, uh, for production services, it's true because the, uh, the above one also matches, right? But the only thing that both have in common is that it's true, right? If it's the one is true, the other one cannot be uh, true anymore. So true is the only thing that works. 
in this case. Is it just the combination that you were talking about? Yeah, the combination, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and because it's not inheritance, one doesn't override the other, right? It doesn't matter in which order I apply it. I mean, maybe I should have said false here, right? Because the default is true already, but uh, with false it would work too. Um, so, so far I've said Q is not aware of anything specific. It, it's not Kubernetes aware. Um, and so we only seen fields for deployments that we have specified, but how do I really know now? Uh, that, that it's enforcing uh, a, a correct uh, Kubernetes deployment. Uh, well, you can do that too, right? So typically how you would do that is with imports. You import the Kubernetes schema and, um, and you, you, know, you put in these wildcards and so that it gets pushed out to every, every deployment. Um, then you could ask, well, you know, what if I don't have any Kubernetes schema? So um, as I also alluded to, Q has these adapters, right? So you can basically say Q get go, points to the Go path for, for the, you know, of the Go code. Kubernetes uses Go as the source of truth, by the way, so not, not protocol buffers. The protocol buffers are derived from the source code. Um, so you can do that, like point to the Go uh, uh, code, and it recursively will get all the, all the libraries and create the queue schemas that you can then import into your queue. So of course, nicer if you would, pr would provide that uh, um, as a sort of, you know, pre-generated stuff to users. We're working on that, but uh, right now you can generate it yourself. Works for Prometheus, works for whatever. Um, so uh, another nice thing, so because um, validation is also templating, right? Like you, um, um, you can do all kinds of nice tooling around this. So one example is suppose that um, you start out with, with concrete configurations, like you, you just converted your YAML or whatever, or maybe it still is YAML. Um, so you, you, you have your concrete configuration, which you see on the right-hand side here, for your punk service. And only later you started adding the templates or the validation, right? So in this situation, the template you have on the left-hand side is really validating that the values that you also have on the right-hand side are correct, right? But now we're saying, okay, so I've made these templates now. Now I want to, you know, I kind of want to restructure my configuration so I don't have all this redundancy. Um, well, because you don't have inheritance, right? It's it's quite easy to derive, like what what you know, you know, what you can derive from your templates, right? So you can very easily see uh, what becomes unnecessary. So this is what Q Trim does. So by running this, it will convert the right hand um, uh, the right hand configuration essentially to this, because everything else can be derived from your templates. So it just removes it and, and you know, creates a, a, a removes a, so that you have a single source of truth within your configuration. Um, so Trim was written quite early on because uh, when I created GCL, I had this in my mind with my previous company where we had this fantastic tooling and like really wild things that we would uh, would discover and automatically generate and all that stuff like like you know. You could, most people can only dream of, right? So I had this in mind, and I promised that with GCL. Like the nice thing about declarative uh, configuration is you can do all this wild tooling. Well, guess what? As soon as you use overrides, you're done. You cannot do that anymore. Uh, but this mantra got all repeated. Like, yeah, we do all this automation. Like, where is the automation? Show me the automation. There is no automation, right? So, um, and this stuff is a little bit hard to, to build, but I wanted to have at least one thing where I show, like, look, this is what you can do if you have like, uh, you know, a good model behind your declarative configuration. So this is, uh, Qtrim is the first uh, start of it, but other things you can imagine, uh, this is all possible. It's like given all my configurations, concrete configurations like YAML, JSON, uh, give me the min minimal set of templates um, that can produce these configurations, right? So like automatically refactoring, you know, this is all possible. We'll, we'll work on it in the, in the future, but we're not quite there yet. So, doesn't quite stop here yet. Um, so Q is used for all kinds of things. So actually, the, maybe the biggest application for Q is not so much configuration, but composable workflows. Um, we see that most companies using Q, or at least half of them, are, are, are going into that direction. Uh, we have a lot of policy um, uh, startups and companies, uh, uh, you know, doing things with Q, like in supply chain, uh, chain security, for example, <coughs> API generation. Already mentioned that. Network automation. One of my favorites is uh, somebody encoded the entire U.S. tax code. I don't know if they did the alternative minimum tax also, but uh, the entire U.S. tax code in Q. And the uh, the reasoning was there is, uh, you know, so so if you encode all the rules in the tax code, you don't necessarily want to know how you want to use it, right? Like, do you want to fill in this part? Do you want to fill in this part? And then derive the rest. 
So with Q, because it goes in all these directions and it's logic programming, right? Like uh, they found that it's it's um, it's it's the easiest way to basically um, be able to reuse all these rules, no matter what you want your API to be, right? So that's a pretty wild application of Q. So the Q project. Um, so as I said, Q is really more than just a language, right? It has all these tooling, refactoring. Uh, you have some, some libraries in Go that you can use to, to create these dynamic workflows and stuff like that. People use that a lot. Um, so then for the encodings, so we have um, a bunch of supported encodings. Some of them are only in one direction. Um, you know, we want to step that up so that we uh, make that a little bit more com uh, complete, but also allow users to write their own uh, encodings if they have to through the WASM interface. Uh, so Postgres is a, is a nice one, right? Like you, you can have uh, incomplete references in Q uh, if you think about it, right? It, it is logic programming, so really this is one-to-one -one, um, equal to SQL, right? So we should easily uh, be able to create an SQL generator from, from Q. Um, uh, you know, this is all sort of um, TB, TBD, right? So these are some of the users. Uh, really wildly different uh, use cases uh, for Q. Some of them are using it for test generation, uh, API generation. As I said, a lot of uh, uh, telecom and, and clouds uh, where it's mostly for CICD like stuff. Um, we're currently seven strong at the moment. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, might be hiring more in the future. We'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, so as a conclusion, um, so we really think that, that a unified uh, approach to configuration is really uh, key to increasing reliability, right? It's not just cute, it's not just convenient, but um, there's a lot of information that you have in code um, and, and configuration and spread out through the system that if you, if you intersect that, you'll be actually able to find a lot of problems with your system that are really uh, undiscovered in a lot of cases uh, right now. And uh, with that, um, I want to say, like, first of all, you know, if you have any questions, you can contact me here. Uh, you know, also happy to take contributions in, in any direction. And with that, I'll uh, leave it for Q&A. Thank you. Any questions? Pardon? Ah, yeah, yeah. So, so we have um, a very minimal LSP uh, setup, which is only syntax. Uh, but we have uh, our top priorities for development uh, are um, some more like community modules, right? So modules you don't have to so with, without vendoring. Um, that's one. So the WASM support, and then the next big thing to to really do is uh, LSP. So we already have people uh, started working on that. Uh, so Dagger, one of the companies using Q, has m made their own uh, LSP for, for Q also. Uh, but it's more a little bit more Dagger specific. But uh, yeah, using the, either the Go one or the Dagger one as a start for Q is uh, high on our uh, agenda, yeah. So, so we, re we realize that that's a critical uh, piece of uh, infrastructure for Q, yeah. Any other question? Ah, there, yeah, James. Um, so Let's say I'm super convinced that it would be safer for the configuration. Um, is there a fear or a worry that understanding the complex mechanisms that are, are available to the program writers yeah. could cause a new source of error because they think they're doing one thing but they misunderstand and make those sorts of programming bugs? Is that a worry? Yeah, we haven't really... Repeat the question, uh, all right, okay, so I'll repeat the question. So, so uh, the question is, if I understand it correctly, is, is there a fear that by using this, and if you start using Q and, and putting it all uh, in this in this system, that this gives rise to sort of new types of failures? Is that what I'm... New types of programming complexity bugs. New types of pr programming complexity bugs, yeah. So, um, so aside from, from potential bugs in Q itself, right? So let's let's uh, rule this uh, this out for now. Uh, they're there, right? But but uh, that's a different kind of uh, problem. So um, we have now some users that are big enough um, to sort of be able to see that at least uh, our theory that it should be working, that it's really working, right? So. Um, so we, we've seen configurations where you have, uh, you know, about 40,000 lines, which is not that big, right? But it's, it's spread across 40 teams already. It's coming in from all these different angles. 
So in my experience with the GCL, uh, GCL is basically, uh, JSONnet is sort of like the, the open source port of, of GCL, right? It's, it's very similar. So it, it would have been fallen flat on its face like long before that, right? So, so we know that, uh, that with this approach we have been able to avoid these uh, scaling issues. And with scaling I mean software engineering issues, right? where, where people cannot understand it anymore. So, um, so in talking to these uh, companies we've had basically... Um, so the problems they're running into is really like, okay, when are you supporting modules or, or you know, this part is a bit slow or whatever, but uh, the software engineering part is, is not a problem at all, right? So it's, uh, and as I said, in, the, in, in these old days, right, this is slightly different formalism, but still it was, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines uh, without much of a management issue, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Like you have, you know, because the people can make our record to show the four levels, <coughs> they can have four levels, and they can. Yeah. Um, and you can have overrides of all these like, locations, and you have a final answer where it's going from. Yeah. So the question is uh, do you have any kind of tooling to show. Um, where overrides are coming from, and, and like uh, if, if that's if that's correct. So first of all, uh, Q doesn't have overrides, well, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, but um, but yeah. So what the evaluator does it basically um, keeps track of every single value in the input. So it's it's a little bit expensive, right? But at the end of your evaluation, you have the um, the uh, the full history of where things are coming from, um, and. Um, we don't visualize that yet. Our idea was so like once we have the LSP, we visualize it in the LSP, right? Like that, that would be the, the obvious things to do. Uh, but it would be, uh, yeah, it would be trivial to, to implement that because the information is right there, right? We just, yeah. Uh, and, and users can do that in the API. So you can easily in the API, you can see, you, you can get all the, all the locations, yeah. Yeah, so the question is if uh, somebody publishes some, some schema or templates, uh, can it be referenced uh, in, as a URL? So right now this is uh, not the case, but this is one of these features that is uh, very high up in the list, where we have like a, basically a package management uh, system, right, where you baby, basically people can publish uh, these packages, whether it's templates or schema, and then uh, yeah, download them and, and sort them. So you would just have to reference it in your, in your code, very much like Go would work, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as far as I can tell, uh, you as a language is open source, it's mm -hmm. admirable, but how do you ensure the uh, sustainability of it? Like how do you fund it basically? Just because you're a company, uh, how do you use the language or what kind of, how do you make sure that it exists from five years? Yeah, so, so the question is how does it um, uh, survive as a, as a company and, and with funding? So um, there are some pretty good uh, models, I would say, on, on funding open source. So, um, um, you know, you could, you could say that, that Q is uh, similar to um, Elasticsearch in some way, like how you could possibly uh, fund it, right, which is a quite successful model. So there's it's very similar, a lot of similarities there. but. Um, yeah. So, so th th yeah, I can I can take it offline. There's there tons of uh, tons of possibilities. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Where can we find you? Uh, because there's no dedicated Q room for discussions. Marcel uh, uh, is here the rest of the day. I'm here the rest so of the day. I'm here to. You can to, find him yeah. somewhere around. Yeah. To, today, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. 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 O otherwise, uh, DM me on uh, on Twitter or something, and then we'll. Uh, next next yeah. year, you'll he'll organize a complete room for a whole day. I'll I'll do that. Yes. I'll do okay. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you. Thank you.